today, want, again, I want to just uh, talk with you about three levels of living. And, um, and hopefully the goal is to inspire you or encourage you to maybe step it up a little. And me too, because I, you know, I, I, I'm always the first one that gets preached to. I hear it when I'm preparing it, and then I hear it when I give it, you know. And so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm the one most accountable for this stuff. So uh, when we first become believers, I think, I know with me, when I first became a believer, I thought the Christian life would be sort of like this on the growth continuum, you know, just sort of be... Woo, every day I'm becoming more and more like Jesus. And, you know, one of these days I'll just glow in the dark. Head shake and you go, no, that is not what it's like, is it? No, it really isn't that way, is it? Um, I've kind of found that um, it's, uh, it's more, like, more like this, maybe. The real Christian growth continuum. We're kind of plugging along, and then all of a sudden we hit a wall. And something happens. Um, there's a problem. There's a crisis. Uh, you know, you rub the lamp and you pray and the genie just doesn't respond, right? You know, it just didn't do what you wanted him to do, you know, and something bad happens. And, you know, your, your kid gets sick and doesn't get better or your, your, your friend dies or uh, you, you, your marriage falls apart or you, you lose your job or your, your business goes bankrupt or just something happens, you know, and, and you kind of hit that wall. And I found that that wall... We have a lot of those. And if you respond properly in those, you, you find yourself going up to a new level of walk with the Lord. And then you, then you kind of plug along for a while, but there's another wall coming. And you hit that wall, and then it's another crisis. And, and I, I mean, this kind of sounds discouraging, but I've found, at least in my life, that the next crisis is even bigger than this crisis. But I have bigger spiritual muscles, so I'm able to handle it. Some of the things that have happened to us in the last few years, man, we're possibly wiped us out. I believe there would have been grace for it, but, but God controls those things, you know, and he, 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 he does that to build muscles. Because you know how muscles are actually built. It's, it's, it's not by watching TV, um, which I'm very disappointed with. But it's, <laughs> what happens is w when you actually are lifting weights or pressing beyond, you're actually tearing your muscle. And it actually tears, or micro tears, and then those tears heal back, and that's what makes it stronger. And so it's the same way in life. These difficulties that we hit, if we, we have a choice when we hit that wall, we can respond, and as one guy said, you can get bitter, or you can get better. And when those bad things happen, those things that just catch you off guard, and it just didn't go the way you thought it was supposed to go, what I found is the way to successfully navigate those is you have to apply the cross at every one of those. And when I say apply the cross, what I'm talking about is, is laying down your own life and trusting that God is in control of this. And it's, it's really the dying to self, as Jesus talked about. That means dying to my own goals, my own aspirations, dying to me being on the throne of my life and Him really being on the throne of my life. And so I, I wanted this, that was my goal, that's what I wanted, and I prayed for that to happen, and I worked for that to happen, and it just all fell apart. And that's when I have to apply the cross and say, okay, God, your will, not mine. I wanted that. I hoped that would happen. But obviously, either it's not going to happen or it's not going to happen now. And so you're at work in my life. And so I continue to trust you. And if I do that, expressing forgiveness, expressing, it takes a great deal of trusting God to do that. But if I do that, then I find I'm taken to the next level. But again, there's going to be a time. It may be a long period of time. It may be right on the heels of that one that I'm going to hit another wall. Something else is going to catch me off guard. And again, it's, that, it's the Lord seeing if I, if I will build those spiritual muscles and grow in Him. And so to apply, to, to keep growing in each of them, we have to apply the cross. Now, what I've seen is that there, there are like these three levels of living that we do. And, uh, and we've probably all been at least at the first level. And so let's, what I want to do is look at those three levels and characteristics of each of these three levels. And so the first level is, um, well, here's a problem. Too many of us have just enough Jesus to make us miserable, right? And that means we're probably living at that first level. What I mean by that is you have enough of the Lord in your life that you just can't even enjoy the pleasures of sin, right? I mean, the, the Scripture says sin is... It's pleasurable. It's, it's, it's fun or nobody would do it, right? And so we have just enough Jesus that we, we can't enjoy doing that because we know it's stupid and we know it's wrong and we just feel bad about it. And so we can't enjoy that. But we're not in enough that we really enjoy the full benefits of a totally committed life. And so we end up walking that fence, you know. And so you, you, you're just miserable all the time. And some of us just have enough, just enough Jesus to 
be miserable. Well, that's not where we want to live. We want to look at the third level and how we can get there. But let's start with the first one, and we'll call that the carnal man, the self-life. This is the guy who's he's on the own throne of his own life. He's carnal. Carnal is a, just simply means fleshly. He lives at the level of his body, his flesh, his, his, his desires. desires, his own desires. And um, now this guy can be an unbeliever, but guess what? He can be a Christian. I, uh, I had heard that there was no such thing as a carnal Christian. And I used to believe that because my pastor told me that until a friend of mine named Paul um, told me differently. Uh, he'd, he'd written a book, a book about it, and uh, it's called 1 Corinthians. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he says this, I'm writing to you, the saints in Corinth, set apart, sanctified, the believers. But then in chapter 3, he says, I sure wish I could have written to you about some other things, but I can't because you're carnal. Wait a minute, you're writing to the saints and yet they're carnal? Huh. Paul apparently thinks that there can be carnal Christians, so I had to change my doctrine. And guess what? Do you know how he could tell they were carnal? 1 Corinthians 3.3, 3, here's what he says. You're still carnal. You know how I know that, he says? For where there is envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal? Behaving like mere men? Wait a minute. If envy, strife, and divisions means we're carnal, I think back to what's been going on in this COVID problem and all the fights in churches over masks or no masks or opening or not opening and all that stuff. I'm beginning to think that not only can Christians be carnal, but maybe the majority of us are. It's not the rarity. It's not the exception. It's the rule. If there's fights, if there's envy, if there's division, Paul says, you're carnal. Yes, you're saints. Yes, you're sanctified. Yes, you're set apart for God, but you're carnal. And so we're not just talking about unbelievers here, but we're talking about even believers. And so let's look at some of these characteristics that we find in the carnal believers even. One is they, uh, they live for today. You know, there's, there's no delayed gratification. Um, I, uh, I want this, and so, well, I don't have the money for it. I could save for it, or I can just go pop it on my credit card. And so this can oftentimes lead to debt. This can oftentimes lead to marriage struggles and problems in relationships because of debt. Um, it, can, it can lead to all kinds of problems because I live for today. Everything is about me and today. And uh, then secondly, they're, they're life's arrows. Now, what I mean by that, it's like uh, as, as a baby, when a baby is a, a little infant, all of their arrows, little term I just use myself, point inward. By that, what I mean is like the little baby wakes up at 2 a.m. and he lays in his crib and he goes, man, you know, I kept mama up pretty late last night. She's probably really tired. So I think I'll just lay here a while, look at the ceiling. I don't want to disturb mom. I'll wait until the sun comes up and then I'll wake her up, right? That's how little babies function, right? No, because all, all they care about is themselves. All the arrows are pointing in. It's me, 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 me. And so all the life's arrows for a little infant point in. Okay, so that's what this carnal man is. It's all about me. And in fact, that's who he lives. He lives to please three people. Me, myself, and I. <laughs> Those are the three people that he's all about pleasing. His life is there to, to please these people. And um, again, you know, this guy, uh, let's look at some of the other characteristics. His, his financial goals in life it would kind of go by this model. Get all I can and can all I get. You know, it's all about me. It's all about me. You know, I'm not going to, that, that church doesn't need my money. I work hard for it. You know, they got more money than they know what to do. That missions project, those hungry kids, that, that thing over there, it's, they don't need that. I need it. I work hard for my money. And so it's all about me, 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 me. Get all I can. Can all I get. Keep it all. And then um, his life partner goals, when he's looking for a spouse, he or she looking for a spouse, it's like, uh, I need to find someone that can love me, someone that can uh, serve me. Someone that can love me. Well, I, I, I love them. And here's how I know I love them because I love you because when I'm around you, I feel so different. I feel so fulfilled. You fulfill me. So who is that really about? It's really about me. How you make me feel. And I think that's love. That's not love, is it? 
That's not love at all. And so that, that's what it's all about. I love you because you make me feel this way. I love you because you serve me. You take care of me. I, I was, uh, my first trip to the Philippines, I, was, I rode China Air, which I learned never to do that again. But I was flying China Air back. And as I'm going down, it's, it's a real kind of, it's a lot of ex wealthy Chinese businessmen on. So they're all in suits flying on these, you know, and, and this is in cabin, you know, I'm not flying. I'm flying coach. So as I'm walking down the aisle, there's all these well-dressed Chinese businessmen and people and, and sitting down where my seat is, the, my empty seat right next to me is a guy with a welder's cap on and a t-shirt and he's got a pack of cigarettes rolled up under the sleeve here, you know, <laughs> obviously not a Chinese businessman. And I'm thinking, well, this is going to be an interesting 12-hour flight, you know. So I sat down by him and began talking. So, hey, what are you doing in the Philippines? Oh, I came to meet my wife. Came to meet your wife? Oh, so she was here and you came to meet her? Well, no, I came to meet her because uh, I, I hadn't met her before. I hadn't met her before. But she's going to, well, she's going to be my wife, you know. He says, uh, he says, I've been married three times, been divorced three times. And my buddy's told me, he says, you need to get yourself a Filipino wife because they'll serve you like a king. And he said, so... So I decided I wanted a Filipino. Well, how did you meet this woman? Oh, you can get them in a magazine. He said, they gave me a magazine. And so I flipped through and I found one that looked good. And so I called her up and I talked to her and, and I came over here to meet her. You met her? Oh, yeah, yeah. So how, oh, it went just really well. Her family just treated me like a king. I mean, I was like in a hammock on the beach the whole time. They're bringing me stuff to drink. And it was just wonderful. I said, so you speak Tagalog? Oh, no, no, I don't. She speaks English. Oh, no, but we got along just great. We got, she treated me like a king, you know, just treated me like a king. And I'm thinking, well, okay, it probably is better that you don't speak the same languages, you know. So, but, I mean, this was this, I'm just thinking clueless, you know. Totally, it's all about me. She treated me like a king, you know. And, and uh, so, therefore, we got along great. You treat me well, we're going to get along great. I mean, that's like an extreme position, but that was this guy. So life partner is uh, someone who can serve me, you know, someone who makes me feel good about myself. So that's how I know I love them. Where are the fears? Because we all have fears. In fact, we should have fears. There are things we should be afraid of. So we all have fears. And what are this guy's fears, this carnal guy's? It's a fear of being rejected by the world. Whatever it takes to where I'm not canceled, whatever it takes to be accepted by those around me, those in my world, those who are important to me. I do whatever it takes. And <clears throat> here's the thing, we, we probably all start thinking, when we, when we mention this, we all begin thinking about the kind of those groups we don't understand. Well, like, yeah, those goth kids, you know, with the black fingernails, and they always dress like they're going to a funeral, you know, and like, uh, yeah, they, they're, they're that way. They're, the, they're, they're that nonconformist and just whatever. And, uh, or, or those, those biker, those 1% bikers, you know, and they all those bad guys and, and the people that we don't understand. And, uh, or, or it might be those who are the politically incorrect the Antifa folks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're like that. They're very carnal. Or could the other side of the spectrum, the KKK, yeah, they're that way, those racists, you know, and whatever. Or whatever. We might think of those folks, and <clears throat> they, they may be carnal, you know, as long as one of the ways they're not rejected by their friends is make sure they hate the right people and speak bad of the right people and speak good of the right people and, you know, all that kind of stuff. But here's the problem. It could be that, what would you say, layer of society, or it could be <clears throat> that it's an ultra-conservative or an ultra-liberal. And so the way he's not rejected by his world or she's not rejected by her world is always wearing the right clothing, the right brand name, driving the right car. I drive an electric car. I drive a hybrid. I drive a dually truck that pours more gasoline than I can put in it in an hour, you know? I mean, whatever it is, you know? I mean, it's... Whatever it takes to not be rejected by my world, that's what I do. Because I, I fear not being accepted by my world. And so, um, but now, now here's the other one. It could also be this. It could also be the way that I'm accepted, the way that I, I, I'm not rejected by my world. It could be that I, I learn the right vocabulary. I go to the Bible studies. And when somebody says something, instead of saying, wow, that's really nice. I'm glad to hear that. You go, amen, brother. Praise God. Hallelujah. I learned the right vocabulary. I learned when to say the right words. You know, and, and, and that could be the way. You know, only our heart knows, right? That could be the way that we keep from being rejected. And so um, the point is that it's, it, it's crucial that this person not be rejected and their acceptance comes from those in their world. And so that's this carnal believer, because I'm living. I, I'm on the throne of my own life. I've got to make sure that I'm, I'm accepted in my world. And so 
<clears throat> Next characteristic is what do they do when all else fails? Because this kind of life is going to fail, right? So what do you do when all else fails? Well, you may dull the pain by alcohol. You may dull the pain with drugs. Um, you may dull the pain with frenzied activity. You go to every conference, every Bible study, you're part of everything. You're serving here and there. You're just whatever it takes to kind of dull the pain. Um, you might begin to live your life through your kids. But one thing you want to make sure of is that you have a perfect life on Facebook mm -hmm. and Instagram. Right there, it's that moment. It's beautiful. Everything's going well. Or if it gets really bad, you might just flame check out death, suicide, hiding out from people, becoming a hermit, video games, 24-7, whatever. So the motto they live by is <clears throat> do one to others before they do one to you. Right? Okay? So that's, that's, the, that's the, the carnal man. And, and we all know that that's not how you're supposed to live. Although we probably all kind of maybe drift into that to one degree or another at some point in time, you know. We know that's not how you're supposed to live. And even if we're living that way, we go, well, that's not the right way to live because, hey, after all, we're here in church, right? We know that, right? We know better. So let's look at the second level of living. We probably all were there one time at this first level, but then we got saved. Then we became a believer. And so we're going to look at the second level, the Christian man, the Christian life, the saved life, the life of a, a believer. What does he live for? What are these characteristics? He lives for tomorrow. Well, it might not be too good today, but I'm trusting God. I'm believing God's going to do better things. Live for tomorrow. His life's arrows point outward toward others. So when immature, everything's about us. The selfish guy on the throne, it's all about me. But as we grow, as we mature, the idea is that these arrows begin to point outward and we begin to be conscious and aware of others more than ourselves. You know the story. What is, how do you spell joy? Jesus first, others second, yourself last. This is good. This is all good. Who does he live life to please? I live life to please others. Jesus first, others second, myself last. Joy is good. All good, right? So what are, what are some of the other characteristics following down? <clears throat> what are his financial goals? Well, get all I can. I want to make a good living so that I can give. I want to be generous. I, you know, the generous man prospers. I want to be able to help the poor. I want to be able to help my church. I want to be able to help people. So I, I'm going to make, do what I can to make a good living, provide for my family, because if I don't provide for my family, I'm worse than an infidel. The Bible says a generous man will prosper. You know, the Bible says godliness with contentment is great gain. Or, or does it say godliness and great gain, now that's contentment. I'm not sure which. No, I'm, I'm, it does say godliness with contentment. So <clears throat> his, life, his life partner goals, who's he looking for? Someone that I can love and someone that, that I can serve, that I can care for others, again, above myself. These are all good, right? How about, how about the fears? Man, I, I, I fear being polluted by the world. I want to keep myself clean, you know. I don't smoke, don't chew, don't go with girls that do, you know, that kind of thing. And got a lot of rules I got to keep, you know. And so <clears throat> these are my goals in life is to stay on the straight and narrow, you know, be, live right. And um, what, are my, what are my acceptance? My acceptance comes from those in my church and my family, my Christian family, the <laughs> leaders and my friends and my class and, and just those in my small group. Those, those are the, that's where I get acceptance. And it's, it's, um, it's real important that I learn a new language and learn a new vocabulary. And this is really important. This is a very important part of being, being here is I, I need to um, have a growing disgust for those who indulge in worldly things and those who live a non-traditional life and, and who make poor lifestyle choices. And it, it's helpful if I express that disgust so everybody knows that I don't approve of that. You know what I'm saying? Th that is wrong. That is disgusting. And, that, and, the, and the more that disgusts me, the more I'm accepted. Right? Hmm. I have to let people know that I disapprove of that. Because if I actually approved of that, or if I didn't approve of that, but if I actually was loving towards somebody who's making those bad choices, it could look like I'm approving of it. And I can't have that, because I might not be accepted. Well... This guy's miles ahead of our carnal friend, but I see some of you kind of shaking your head going, wait a minute, you're setting me up here, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, well, I kind of am, I kind of am. Okay, you caught me. But, so he is, I mean, this is okay. There's really nothing, I mean, there's, it's good to 
you know, not want to be polluted by the world. These are, these are good things to care for others above yourself, but that's not all there is to it. Let's, let's finish out and then we'll look at a, a third level. Uh, when all this fails to satisfy, what do you do? You block out pain by food? You block out pain by uh, frenzy, good works? You circle the wagons, we're just going to focus on my family here and we're going to, we'll all go to church, we're all just going to sit together and we'll do our own little thing, you know, and, and, and there's just all kinds of ways that when, when this life fails to satisfy, how we try to fill that void. And uh, our, the motto of this person is, don't do to others what you would not want them to do to you. Come on, just be nice. Get along. So that's, that's, the, um, that's the Christian life. And uh, while, there's, while that's sure miles ahead of the carnal life, I got to tell you, from the time I first became a believer, I never wanted to be a Christian, just a Christian. Now, if you take Christian and what it really means, what it really means is a, 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 a miniature, a, a little Christ. It means you're like Jesus, you're living like Jesus. And if, and if you're using that definition of Christian, then that's okay. But in our culture, Christian just means you're not a pagan, right? Christian means, I don't know what it means, but I don't want to be one of those. That's all I know, you know? <laughs> I believe in God. Yeah, so does the devil and his angels. In fact, so much so that James says, when you even mention it, he trembles. You see, there are things we all need to be afraid of, too. Fear of the Lord is a good thing. So I didn't, want, and I didn't want to raise my kids to be a Christian. I wanted to raise my kids to be a passionate follower, a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's really our third level. That's the third level we want to look at. And what, what we're going to call this guy is the crucified man, a sacrifice life, the crucified life. And of course, that comes from Galatians 2.20, where, where Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I'm crucified, but I still live. But it's not me that's living. It's Christ who lives in me. It's a whole different thing than just, well, we'll look at it a little bit more. We're going to see the characteristics, and then we'll, we'll see why I'm saying this is a different level than just being a Christian, okay? Um, it's Christ that lives in me, and the life which I live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me. He gave himself for me. This is, this is a whole other level of living. Let's look at the characteristics of this sacrifice life. He doesn't live for today. He doesn't live for tomorrow. He lives for that day, that day when I stand before the Lord. I make my decisions I make my, uh, I shape my life based upon that day when I stand before the Lord and I'm going to give an account. And by the way, as I say this, this is my goal. I'm not here yet. And maybe someday I am. You know, somebody asked me one time, are you spirit filled? And I go, mm, sometimes, hmm. you know, but I leak. You know, <laughs> sometimes, I'm, sometimes I'm really spirit filled. Other times you wouldn't even know I'm a believer, let alone, you know, it's just, I leak. I need to be filled continually. I need to be in his presence continually. Or I just become that carnal man. So we all, and I'm going to make some, I've made some generalizations here, and uh, there's, there's a lot of overlap because we all kind of drift from one to the other. And that idea is to become more and more live the crucified life because I'm living for that day. When I make a decision, I don't think of, well, how's that going to make me look? What are people going to think about me? What are people going to say about me? I think about what is the Lord going to say when I stand before him on that day? I will make that decision based upon what he'll say to me on that day. So the crucified person lives for that day. The crucified person is Eros. He's not a baby. It's all about me. But neither is he. This is what we would call mature, one whose arrows are always thinking about others. But his arrows are pointing toward the Lord. And that's what Jesus said. He said, I only say those things that I hear my father say. I only do those things that I see my father do. I remember one time I was reading that passage and kind of meditating on it where Jesus said, I only say those things that I hear my father say. And I just, in my head, I thought, wow, if I only say those things that I heard God say, I wouldn't say much. <laughs> and it's kind of like the Holy Spirit said, you're getting the idea. <laughs> oh, okay. So we're living for that day. Our arrows are pointing toward the Lord. I'm living for him. And then I live life to please him alone. Now, when I'm doing things that please God, that might please, probably going to please my wife because I'm going to be showing care for her and concern for her. It might please a lot of people. It might make a lot of people happy when I'm living more for the Lord. But there might be some who don't like it. But I'm not worried about that one way or another. 
Remember that old song, I had decided to follow Jesus? Oh, good. I was hoping I wasn't the only one who sang that one, you know. I didn't remember what the arrow was, you know. <laughs> because I haven't heard it in a long time. But it says, I'm, I've decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. And then one of the verses says, though none go with me, still I will follow. Sometimes we may find ourselves in that, where nobody around us is willing to go. But I'm not living for those around me. I'm living for him alone. What are some of the other characteristics of this person here? The financial goals. Well, I recognize that whatever comes my way, it all belongs to him anyway. I, I don't, the, 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 the crucified person doesn't worry about tithing and counting out the 10% and making sure he gives all 10% because it all belongs to God. And so I'm going to give far above. And if I see a need, I'm going to help here and I'm going to give here and I'm going to give there. And it's like 10% is like a baseline. I wouldn't even, don't even count about, don't even count that. Because not 10% belongs to the Lord. It all belongs to him, doesn't it? 100% belongs to him. Because guess what? I'm crucified. I died a long time ago. And so nothing belongs to me. In fact, here's the prayer of the crucified person. It's in Proverbs about finances. He says, two things I ask of you, Lord. Don't refuse me before I die. Keep falsehood and lies far from me. And give me neither poverty nor riches. Hey? Give me neither poverty or riches. Give me only my daily bread. You see, again, everything Jesus taught is in the Old Testament. Give me my daily bread. Otherwise, if I have too much, I might disown you. Who needs the Lord when I got everything taken care of? Or if I don't have enough, I might be tempted to steal and dishonor your name. And so the, the crucified life says, Lord, I, it all belongs to you. You're going to give me my daily bread, which, of course, refers back to that manna experience in the wilderness. Remember when they went out and got their daily bread? And you couldn't collect more than you needed for the day or it would, it would spoil. And so God took care of them day by day. And so, Lord, I'm looking to my daily bread. You're going to provide for me today. You provided for me yesterday. You're going to provide for me tomorrow. You're going to provide for me the day after. I'm not here to see how much I can get and can all I can get and get all I can, you know. It all belongs to you, Lord. And so those are the, the financial goals of one of his life partner. He's looking for someone who loves God, first of all. Someone who's serving God passionately. You know, you can marry a Christian and still be unequally yoked. Because there, you, you may be passionate about the Lord and the other person might be cold about the Lord. And God wants us to be pulling together, equally yoked. And so, someone with whom I can more fully serve the Lord. In fact, what I, what I tell young folks and folks who are not married yet or looking for partners, I say, you know what? <clears throat> if you'll just serve God fully, you'll just pursue Him with your whole heart, one of these days, you're going to look alongside you, and there's going to be somebody who's going the same direction you are at the same speed you're going. And that's probably the one he wants you to hook up with, you know. And so just pursue God fully. You just chase after the Lord, and he'll take care of all these other stuff. What's it say? Seek first the kingdom of God, his righteousness. And what happens? He takes care of all these other things. All the other stuff just falls into place when you're seeking first his kingdom. And so that's their life partner goals, is someone who's kingdom-focused like me, pursue God. What about their fears and acceptance? Because, again, there are things we should fear, and, there are th and, and we all do need acceptance. God built that into us to where we need to be accepted. But the problem is, what do we fear? Who do we fear? What do we do to, to gain acceptance? And so the crucified person fears the Lord. The fear of the Lord is a good thing. And the best definition, you know, we say fear when it's not really fear. It really means awe, respect. No, it really means fear. It really means fear. But it's, it's a proper fear, and it's this type of a fear. It's like a recognition that one day, in fact, I think this is the best definition for the fear of the Lord, a constant awareness that one day I'm going to stand before him and give an account for every word, thought, and deed. Every idle word, every idle thought, every deed. I'm going to stand before him and give an account. So that causes me to fear, in a way, the normal word for fear, but in the other way, I know that the price has been paid, and I know that I have a God who loves me. And so I don't fear like, well, because perfect love casts out that type of fear, because fear has the sense of judgment, in, quoting from John there. And so there is, a, there is an awe and a respect, but it's more than that. It's like, a wow, God, one of these days, yes, you love me. Yes, you're my dad. But if you're going to be a good dad, your kids need to know if they cross the line, there's some fear. 
The best, best illustration I have of, I was principal of a Christian school for a while, back in the days when you could spank. And uh, did it regularly. In fact, we were at a wedding not long ago. A big kid comes up to me. Says, oh, well, actually, three of the three, actually, these were girls came up to me. I had a big guy come up to me one time and goes, hello, Mr. Mom. You remember spanking me regularly? Yeah, I do, Dwayne. Hi, how you doing? You know? <laughs> at, this, at this renewal of the vows, the three girls came up to me. And all three of them said, yeah, you spanked me. And one of them said, yeah, I didn't cry. It really gave me some street cred at the school. <laughs> I said, I can't believe you didn't cry because I always made sure there was some, there was a lot. I always made sure it hurt them more than it hurt me, you know, let's put it that way. So <laughs> the point is, um, I remember I was, uh, I, uh, we had a new kid at the school and I had this big plate glass window that was right next to the playground, which is a crazy idea, but anyway, plate glass window next to the playground. And there was a drinking fountain right outside my office, but I could hear when the kids were at the drinking fountain talking and there was this new kid being shown around the school. And uh, there was like a fifth grader, and the, he was telling, oh, now he was pointing to the glass window. He says, that's Mr. Malm's office. He's really nice, unless you're bad. Then he's terrible. <laughs> and I thought, man, yes, that's exactly what I'm talking about. That's exactly the reputation I wanted to have. He is really nice, unless you're bad. Then he's terrible. And that's our father. I mean, that's our God. He is really nice. He's forgiving. He is kind. He is loving. But he's also a terrible God who wreaks vengeance upon his enemies. I mean, so you don't, as it says in, in uh, one of C.S. Lewis's books, he's not one to be trifled with. He's not one to be trifled with. So he, there's a fear of the Lord. And my acceptance comes when we're crucified with Christ. My acceptance comes not from those around me, but because I'm accepted in the beloved. I've been accepted by God. I'm accepted in the beloved. And, and that means that no matter if the world rejects me, though none go with me, still I can follow because I know I'm accepted by the only one who truly matters. By the King of Kings, the Lord of glory, the God of all creation. He's accepted you and me. He knows what we're made of. He knows we're just dust. He knows our frailties. He knows our faults. He knows who we are. And yet he still loves us. Isn't that amazing? He still loves us. And I always say, you know, if he'd wanted a better product, he would have started with a better raw material. He started with dirt. And we're still just dirt, right? Just dirt. In fact, I love, I think it's the Living Bible, and I think it's Isaiah. He keeps referring to him. In, in, in the King James, I think it says, O son of man. And in, um, I think it's the Living, which is a good translation for it, by the way. He says, O son of dust, O son of dirt, you big dirt ball. That's who I'm talking to. I'm just a ball of dirt, Lord, that you filled with your spirit. <laughs> and you know what I'm made of. And I'm heading back to dirt as soon as you depart from me. So he knows what we're made of. So my acceptance comes from the fact that I'm accepting him. But what do you do when it fails? Because even as, even as crucified Christians, we still have those down days. We still have those days of questions. We still have those times of doubts. We still have those times of difficulties. When we hit that wall, you know, and you're going along and all of a sudden, boom, Nothing works out right. You lose the job. You lose your career. The, the, the person your whole church prayed for and fasted for dies from cancer. It just didn't go the way you wanted it to go. What do you do? How do you, uh, how do you respond when those times fail? Paul said it this way. I'm joyful in hope. I'm patient in tribulation. And I'm faithful in prayer. What do you do when you fail? I'm joyful in hope because, again, I'm not living for this day. I'm living for that day. I'm patient in tribulation because I know that tribulation is going to build patience within me. And when patience has finished its full work, James tells us, I'm going to be complete, perfect, lacking nothing. And so I'm patient in tribulation. When I say I am, you realize I'm speaking, <laughs> this is by faith. <laughs> We all have those moments. This is the goal. This is what we're shooting for. This is what we're living for, that we might be patient in tribulation and then faithful in prayer. And finally, what's the motto that this crucified person lives by? Well, you've probably heard it before. Do unto others what you would have them do unto you. And say, so here's the difference. The, the Christian, the nice guy, his motto is, don't do to other people what, what you don't want them doing to you. Well, you know, a stuffed teddy bear could obey that rule. He's not going to do anything to somebody that he doesn't want done to them. But that's not what Jesus said. He didn't just say be nice. He didn't say just don't do mean things to other people. Don't do to other people what you don't want them to do. What he said is you be aggressive. 
He talked about aggressive godliness. Do to others what you want them to do to you. Even if they don't, yeah, even if they don't. Even if they reject me, yeah, even if they reject you. What's, what's that got to do with what they do? You do to them what you would want them to do to you, whether they do it to you or not. Even if they respond hatefully, respond wickedly, respond evilly, you just do to them what you would want done to you. And again, we're crucified with Christ. So this is aggressive godliness, not just being nice. And that's the motto. Now, prior to salvation, I live my life for me. And again, that's the, that's the carnal Christian or the carnal man, Christian, non-Christian. Lives his life for me. Now when we become a believer, guess what? Oh, I live my life for the Lord. Sounds pretty good, right? But there's still a problem with it. The problem is, it's still my life. I'm living my life for the Lord. Before it was, it was I live my life for me, and now it's like I live my life for the Lord. But that's not what we're called to do. Again, Galatians says, it's not my life. It's him living his life through me. And that's what the Lord Jesus wants to live his life through me. That's what the crucified life is all about. It's almost like we become a glove filled by the Spirit of God. And so God then is able to use us to touch the world. It looks like us, but it's really the Spirit of the living God within us that is touching the world. Because the glove is just dead. The glove is powerless. The glove is crucified. But when this power of the living God comes in and fills us, He wants to use us. And so it's just important because we're never going to we're never going to hit the target if we don't even know what the target is. And many times we have this idea that the target is to live my life for the Lord. But really, the target is, I'm crucified. I'm dead. Nevertheless, though I'm dead, I live. But it's not really me that's living. It's Christ living in me, living through me. And so it's a third level of life that we just need to be aware of it, that we're shooting. Because if we're not aware of what the goal is, we're, we don't even know when we fall short of it, right? And so we want to understand that this crucified life, it's really kind of scary, though. Because here's the problem. Dead people don't have any rights. Dead people don't complain. Dead people don't criticize. Dead people... Well, they don't do a lot of the stuff that I find myself doing on a regular basis. <laughs> How about you? <laughs> so that lets me know. As soon as I am upset because someone has trampled on my rights, guess what? Hmm. That's a, that's a red flag. You know, the, the uh, old Lost in Space, uh, Will Robinson, warning. danger, danger, warning, exactly. As soon as I'm upset because somebody's Stepped on my rights, warning Will Robinson, danger, 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 you know. I've got an area of rights, which means it's an area where I'm not dead. Wow. It's an area where the Lord hasn't been able to fill and live his life through me. And so it's, it's kind of a scary thing, but Jesus knew it would be scary, and so he made us a promise in Matthew um, 25. He says, whoever wants to save their life, guess what? You can't do it. It's, you're going to lose it. You're going to lose it. If you, if you try to save it, if you try to live your life, eventually you lose it. It's not going to work. But whoever loses their life for my sake, again, crucified, dead, let him come in and fill that glove and live through us. Whoever loses their life for my sake, what happens? You'll find it. All of a sudden you go, wow, this was scary. But I'm, I'm no longer got just enough of Jesus to be miserable. I'm off the fence. I'm totally in. I am committed. I'm, I'm committed. And all of a sudden you find there's a joy that comes. There's a fulfillment that comes. There's a, but you're never going to experience it until you experience it. You're never going to experience it until you jump in fully. So these are the three levels of life that we have a, have a, 
all lived at at least one of those levels, and hopefully two of those levels, but there's a third level we need to move into. And, uh, and, and, and as much as possible, remain there and live there.